The last time our political leaders voted to change our country's constitution, the last time they passed an amendment to one of our founding documents, uh, was almost 20 years ago, in 1992. It was the 27th Amendment, and it prevents Congress from giving itself a raise. Salary changes cannot go into effect until the next congressional session. Not exactly an issue that recalibrated society, but still an achievement when you consider that that amendment was first proposed 202 years earlier. Changing the Constitution is really hard to do. The last constitutional amendment to pass before the 27th, before the salary rule, was 20 years before that. It was the 26th Amendment. It established the national voting age at 18 years old. Constitutional amendments are very difficult to get through. Take, take, the, take the Equal Rights Amendment, for example. It affirms that men and women have equal rights under the law. Simple enough, right? Au contraire, mon frère. The ERA was first introduced in 1923, just a few years after women won the right to vote. You know, like actual citizens. And then for the next, say, 50-ish years, the amendment was introduced in every single congressional session. Every one. Without ever passing by the necessary two-thirds in both houses of Congress and the required ratification in 38 states. In 1970, a Senate subcommittee began hearings. Ooh, yeah, that's right. A subcommittee. Hearings. Progress. Uh, in the next two years, the ERA was overwhelmingly approved by the Senate, 84 to 8. It also passed in the House. It had seven years then to be ratified by the states. Seven years later, yeah, nothing. Still no equal rights amendment. Still no constitutional amendment saying men and women are equal. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s is the same story failure. Ronald Reagan was the first U.S. president to actually oppose the ERA. The National Organization for Women launched campaign after campaign, demonstration after demonstration. At one point, it just falls three states short of ratification. The ERA came really, really close. Span over a span of decades, they were fighting for it, but it still failed. And while its 85-plus year history is a neat civics lesson, it's also illustrative of today's um, conservative and Republican Party politics and the limits thereof. If you are proposing a constitutional amendment to declare kittens undeniably fluffy and attractive, you would still be wise to have a plan B, because even the most uncontroversial constitutional amendment is hard to pass. Structurally, it's one of those things that was set up to be hard to pass. That means that right now, if somebody's big policy idea about why they want you to send them to Congress is because they're planning on amending the Constitution, if that's someone's platform as a politician, that politician is either very ambitious or knows something that we don't know, or that person is sort of blowing smoke. Because honestly, bucko, you're not going to amend the Constitution. <laughs> you're really not going to do what you say you're going to do. So it is, it is amazing when you look at that history about how hard it is to amend the Constitution. And then you look at the fact that constitutional amendments right now are sort of the bread and butter of what many conservative politicians running for office right now are running for office on. This is what they're proposing. There's, of course, been all this controversy recently about the 14th Amendment, the fact that Republican Senators Lindsey Graham, John Kyle, and Mitch McConnell, and Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty, <laughs> sorry, Tim Pawlenty, uh, not to mention the New Hampshire Republican Senate candidate, uh, all support repealing it, or at least looking into the idea of repealing it. But it's not just the 14th Amendment. Conservatives and Republicans, I mean, if you go back through the George W. Bush administration, they have supported and proposed constitutional amendments for everything. They want to outlaw flag burning, uh, bolster victims' rights in criminal proceedings, uh, outlaw abortions, mandate a balanced budget, outlaw gay marriage, codify the right to school prayer, make some vague gesture toward the already legally established notion of parental rights, require a supermajority to raise taxes, grant the District of Columbia a representative in Congress, but only one, set term limits in Congress, and of course, repeal the aforementioned 14th and the 17th Amendments. It's the Citizenship Amendment, of course, the Equal Protection Amendment, and the 17th is the one that says you get to vote for who your senator is. Conservatives hate that idea now, apparently. <laughs> so when you go to a town hall meeting or you attend a debate between candidates this summer or this fall, or say someone running for office pops by your hot dog stand looking for your vote, if that candidate starts saying to you that the reason they want to go to Washington is because they're planning on amending the Constitution, it's okay to laugh at them. 
It's like asking your kid how he's going to get his grades up in math, and he tells you that he's not planning on studying anymore. He's planning on buying a math superhero costume and letting that take care of the problem. Politicians promising to amend the Constitution are really probably not going to amend the Constitution. They are trying to win votes and raise money and get attention from their promise of amending the Constitution. If you want to get to reality, ask them what they plan to do in the meantime while they're waiting for their constitutional amendment to come through. And remember, it's okay to laugh at them while you say it. Joining us now is Heather Gherkin. She's a law professor at Yale University. Professor Gherkin, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let me um, start with the, the, the premise that I just outlined there, that it's uh, gosh darn difficult to amend the Constitution. Do you think that's a fair assessment? I think that's a quite fair assessment. I mean, in 220 years, we've only done it 17 times. Uh, so the first 10 went through pretty quickly, but after that, it's taken a while, and it usually requires something pretty huge to get a constitutional amendment through. Well, are there certain types of constitutional amendments that historically have been easier easier to pass than others? Well, they're the sort of oops amendments when they realize uh, they wrote something in the Constitution or failed to write something into the Constitution that really ought to be there. So in 1800, when the country nearly fell apart over the presidential race, they amended the Constitution, gave us the 12th Amendment and the Electoral College. Or after uh, FDR, they realized they really needed to think about how many terms a president could serve. Or after Kennedy's assassination, they knew, realized they needed to think about presidential succession. So these are kind of oops amendments. There are things that it would have been nice to have that in there in the first place, but once you realize they need to be there, it's quite easy to pass because they're perfectly sensible and easy to figure out. And the other half of the amendments are the ones that are hard to get. Sometimes uh, they involve huge uh, amounts of time and years and years of work. At one point, three of them involved a civil war. So those are the ones where we are trying to catch up to our democratic credentials when we, we sort of remember that this really isn't a country that's supposed to be uh, controlled by white male property holders. And those are the amendments that are tough to get through as a general matter, uh, and they really take a fight. When politicians um, say to Americans that they promise to amend the Constitution, I, I feel like in every election there's always been somebody saying something about how they were going to amend the Constitution. It just seems notable now that it's happening for, the, for so many different politicians saying they want to repeal multiple amendments, and there's so many that have been proposed um, in the past decade, and so many of them are on the conservative side. I just It makes me wonder if this is a dog whistle thing, if it means something politically other than what it means literally, because these, as as literal promises, these are these seem rather meaningless. Right. I mean, every time you hear a politician, anyone with political experience who says this, you sort of want to say to them, have you cracked open your history book lately? This takes a lot of work to get an amendment through. Even though in some ways, you know, they're appealing to this deep intuition that Americans have, which is, I think, one of our best intuitions, which is that the Constitution belongs to us and we have a right to change it when we want to change it. But you do sense that, that really what they're talking about is a deep unease that Americans have uh, in some parts of the country with what's going on now. And, and the way you tap into that unease is to talk about our Constitution, because it is our Constitution. So whether or not, in the end of the day, it's really just a cynical, rhetorical claim, they're, they're, they're speaking to people in a language that Americans understand. Do, does threatening to change the Constitution, even if you can't pull it off, even if you can't actually amend it, historically has that had an effect on our laws or even on constitutional interpretation, even if the amendment itself hasn't actually worked? Well, th this is what's so interesting, is that sometimes you can amend the Constitution without amending the Constitution. So you just talked about the ERA. It's a great example, as my colleague Reva Siegel has pointed out. The people who worked for the ERA actually got everything they wanted by moving for the ERA. They never actually got it into the text of the Constitution, but everything that was embodied in that amendment was eventually given to them by the Supreme Court. So why did that happen? Well, they used the ERA as an organizing tool. They changed people's minds about the place of women in society and nine of the people whose minds were changed were sitting on the Supreme Court. And those justices eventually began to read the broad parts of the Constitution in a way that was perfectly consistent with the ERA. So, so they got their constitutional amendment. It just isn't in the text. And it just took 85 years, roughly. <laughs> so. It did take a little while. <laughs> Heather Gherkin, law professor at Yale University. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much.